we want to measure how effective, or I guess how we're doing with, with our training. So uh, the best measure, as I understand it, is VO2 max. So could you explain a little bit of what is VO2 max? What is it actually measuring? Sure. So VO2 max reflects the integrated capacity of many physiological systems, but mainly your heart, your lungs, your blood, your muscles to transport and utilize oxygen. And so the higher the rate, the better. So VO2 max is actually measured as a rate. What's the highest rate at which my body can take up and utilize oxygen? It's really important for endurance athletes. And of course, you can imagine they have very high rates of, of oxygen transport. But VO2 max is the laboratory measurement of cardiorespiratory fitness. So it's the best objective measure of cardiorespiratory fitness or cardio health. Mm -hmm. And why it's so important is cardiorespiratory fitness slash VO2 max, same term mm -hmm. uh, or same uh, parameter, is a very strong and independent risk factor of all-cause mortality, so dying from all causes, and many different conditions, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, certain types of cancers. So the higher your fitness, your higher your VO2 max, the lower your relative risk for mm -hmm. developing many of those diseases. So for example, um, you know, VO2 max can be expressed different ways, but having for the average person about a 10% higher fitness level compared to your counterparts uh, will lower your risk of dying by about 15%. So it's a very mm -hmm. clear relationship and again, the bottom line is the higher the fitness level, uh, the greater your health, because the lower your risk for developing many of these conditions that, uh, you know, we, we, we'd like to avoid. What, so the, the VO2 max is measuring actually the, the total throughput of the system. What tends to be the limiting factor? So any of those factors can be limiting, mm -hmm. but for most people, the limiting factor is the heart. So the pumping capacity of the heart, something we measure, uh, the parameter is called stroke volume, which is basically the amount of blood that comes out of your heart every beat. And if we multiply that by how many beats you have, uh, that's your total cardiac output. And so the best evidence would suggest that it's mainly a delivery problem or a delivery limitation. And the primary variable that's responsible for the limitation is the heart and the pumping capacity of the heart. If you did some kind of hypoxic training or I, I guess, yeah, blood circulation limitation, then that may help by putting extra stress on the heart and, and causing it to work harder. Yeah, so I think, again, the best way to improve it is through regular physical activity and exercise right. training. And then, you know, athletes or others are interested in, well, how can we potentially <laughs> manipulate that to eke out a a little bit more and you know the evidence it, it depends and it's it's typically not great for for certain things uh, but clearly you know engaging in more vigorous intensity exercise working harder uh will generally result in 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 greater gains and you know why it's such an important um predictor or has such a strong relationship with many of these diseases is you know cardiovascular disease obviously is a major uh, issue, or if we talk about diabetes, it's often vascular problems that can develop with diabetes. So that might be why it's such a good proxy measure for risk of, of many of these conditions, because the underlying physiology is, is what's enhanced and what can be protective uh, against the risk of developing these conditions. So how would we measure our VO2 max? Um, do we have to go into a lab? Uh, is it, well, is it worth it? Um, so I, I think, you know, mo most people don't need to come into a, an exercise physiology or cardiovascular laboratory and have a VO2 max test uh, mm -hmm. done. Uh, it, it, it's the best, you know, it would be the gold standard uh, to have it measured directly like that. But I don't think it's necessary for most people. Uh, and so um, having a marker, even if it's not completely accurate, is, is better than nothing. And so mm -hmm. there's various ways. Uh, one uh, simple way it, you know, there's many online calculators out there, but to my mind, the best online calculator, uh, you know, your listeners or viewers could Google world fitness level, and that will be, that will take them to an online calculator that's largely been developed out of work, um, 
in Norway. Uh, and and mm -hmm. how that calculator was developed was based on a lot of studies uh, that have looked at um, you know, trying to come up with algorithms to predict VO2 max based on certain inputs. And so the calculator will ask you certain questions, you know, what's your biological age, what's your biological sex, uh, what's your typical resting heart rate that you can measure. And by putting in a few inputs, it'll say, well, a typical person who has these parameters would have a VO2 max value of this. And so again, even if it's not precisely accurate for you, it'll give you a marker in the sand where you can monitor that over time and see if it goes up or down in response to training. You know, um, many apps, fitness apps or gadgets will also give you a VO2 max number. I would say the same thing applies. It, it may or may not be accurate for you, but it will give you a number that you can sort of track over time. And mm -hmm. the last way is there are some very uh, there's validated ways to do a submaximal exercise test. So you can imagine Maybe you get on a bike and you ride at two different levels or a classic one is sort of beat tests where you might remember from grade school or high school, they set up fitness cones and you sort of run back and forth between the cones and each level requires you to run a little bit faster. And so the idea there is if you can complete more of those circuits, your fitness tends to be higher. So mm. a, a submaximal test like that is probably one of the best ways to estimate your VO2 max because at least you're engaged in activity. It's based on a measure of your submaximal heart rate to a defined dose of exercise. Uh, and that would be probably closer to your real value. So take home point there is there's many different ways to estimate fitness. Ideally, it would be something that's routinely measured in the doctor's office, but <laughs> there's just not a convenient and quick way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But having a sense of your fitness and how it changes over time uh, is important, I think. How, so are there any other ways of measuring your, oh, I guess of, yeah, me measuring how well you're doing with your fitness? Like, uh, I mean, I think you can look at your lactate, but are there other things and, and sh is it worth doing those? Uh, again, I think people need to ask themselves, what's, what's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, uh, and, and I, you know, so it, is routine lactate monitoring, required for most people? I think absolutely not, right? If you want to do that, fine. You know, we could get into all the ways that you could do it and it's more <laughs> fraught and it's not as maybe accurate as people think. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, serious athletes will routinely monitor lactate and it can definitely have a, a place there, you know, to identify what training zone they might be in. So it, I think it really depends on the individual, but for that individual who's interested in, you know, they're, they're serious about their exercise and fitness routines. They're maybe not training for a specific sport or event. It's more for general health. I don't think yeah. routine lactate monitoring is, is necessary at all. Um, you know, are there other ways to track this? You know, resting mm -hmm. heart rate is a great marker, you know, so the more fit you are, the greater your cardio or respiratory capacity, the stronger and better pump your heart is it means it has to beat less times every minute. And so that's why resting heart rate is such a, a good indicator mm -hmm. of, of fitness uh, because all things considered, if you know, for a given demand on your heart, if it has to beat less times, that means every time it beats, it's ejecting more blood and that's, mm -hmm. that's better. Uh, right. So definitely resting heart rate can be something that you, uh, you monitor, um, but it's impacted by a number of things, right? If you didn't sleep well, if you have an illness coming on, resting heart rate can be elevated. And it's also why many athletes will use it as a good marker or proxy for risk for overtraining. You know, if you, if your resting heart rate overnight is 10 beats higher than it typically is, maybe that's a signal to you to either take a day off today or, or don't make it a very hard training day. So uh, one thing I was thinking about, how do you set goals for intervals? So I want to see, right, I'm going to start a course and I'm going to do 12 weeks of some kind of test. Okay, so how am I going to say, okay, I did it better this time than last time? Would it be just on VO2 max or would it be like I increase the reps or increase the speed or how would you measure those, do you think? Yeah, I probably not on VO2 max. You know, that could be the marker that you maybe look at the end to say how effective mm -hmm. or not was this series of, of interval training over the last little bit. But I think typically... Uh, you know, there's, there's many ways, but one would be setting it to workload, right? So a classic interval session might be 10 one-minute efforts with a minute of recovery. Mm -hmm. And you say, 
I'm going to try and work at at least 80% of my maximal heart rate. And so every, you know, over the course of the intervals, you want to be at 80% of your heart rate or higher uh, by the end of each interval. That would be one way. You could set a workload goal. So I'm going to do 10 one minute efforts at 200 watts is the setting or 14 mm -hmm. out of 20 on my stationary bike. Um, and I know that that's challenging, you know, that's a challenging load for me. And so there, the degree of effort is going to grow uh, over time. You know, mm -hmm. again, getting back to that 80%, maybe, you know, the, the intervals get a little bit easier each time, because as you start to fatigue and get tired, you still want to at least hold 80%. But I would say the most common way is a specific workload setting, and you try and do a series of intervals that such that on those last couple of intervals, when it's most challenging, you want to successfully uh, achieve or meet your goal um, of uh, of the of completing the workout. Right, but the, that kind of requires a um, stationary bike, right, to measure the workload. I mean, in, you can... in that case, it does. Yes, yeah. you're 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 right. And so you know, again, it might be something as simple as uh, I'm going to go outside in this hill you know, mm -hmm. running up this hill that I know <laughs> might take me a minute or so, I'm going to make, I'm going to try and do five mm -hmm. efforts and uh, I'm going to try and make sure I stay within the one minute time uh, each, uh, each ascent. Right. Try and get it down to 55 seconds or whatever. Yeah. So as we, as we do our, our training, we should get our, our VO2 max may improve. Would we see any blood markers improve as well? You know, is it could we take something like HbA1c at the beginning and at the end, and would the would I, would you say anything? Yeah, so absolutely. And uh, in those trials that I mentioned that are ongoing right now, one of our primary outcomes, uh, at least in the study we're just about to start with individuals with type two diabetes, is HbA1c. Now, mm -hmm. as you would know, you know that it it changes over time, right? And so there you'd want at least maybe a three month intervention or so mm. to see a potential change. But in terms of what you might measure in your blood, so one would be lactate. And so classically, mm. your blood lactate would be lower at a given effort level or given dose of exercise if you're more fit. And so, mm. you know, athletes would want to see their lactate threshold improving, you know, which means that at a given workload, their blood lactate would be lower compared to what it was maybe before a training bout. Uh, for health-related markers, it might be glucose, fatty acids, uh, an HbA1c marker, or other indices of insulin sensitivity. Uh, you know, crude indices based on glucose and insulin markers. So, you know, not necessarily that uh, something that people can always measure on their own. Although there are home, you know, uh, mm. point of care analyzers that 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 you can use. Uh, and some of these, depending on your starting fitness and health, might not change. And so sometimes in our studies, we won't necessarily see large improvements in insulin sensitivity because the individuals already had relatively good glucose control to uh, to, to begin with. So, uh, you know, now if it's an individual looking to improve on their, your health, if your physician is, is amenable to running a, a typical uh, blood panel on you uh, before and say after a six month exercise intervention, uh, that's fantastic because then you can monitor potential changes and improvements over time in some of these blood fat, blood sugar markers. Not everyone responds well to exercise in terms of improvement of VO2 max. I believe there is some genetic component or it may be genetic. So there were a couple of thoughts, questions in there. So one is um, what, how long should you be, how long should you continue with a course of exercise before you just say, okay, this isn't working. And then should you stop? Should you try something different? Is there any reason to believe, like if I was doing Tabata and it didn't get me anywhere, that maybe if I went away and did zone two, then that would that would work for me? Yeah, and, and you're right. So, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about VO2 max and cardiorespiratory fitness because it is such an important metric, but it's not the only uh, marker of health. And, and it is true that some people will engage in six months of supervised structured exercise and their VO2 max doesn't change uh, at all. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as non-responders. Uh, very, uh, you know, we could have a debate, but I, I, I think most people would submit that there's 
there's no true non-responders to exercise. It might be that a certain metric doesn't change, but maybe your blood pressure changes or some measure of vascular health changes or improves. Uh, so, you know, ideally you might like to measure other things uh, as, as well. Um, I'll, you know, I, I'm a proponent of interval training. I engage them in them. Uh, I find they work for me, but I still vary it up, uh, you know, and I still like to go for uh, a moderate walk with my dog for an hour in the woods. So it's not the only thing that I do. And so I, I think, you know, generally speaking, a varied approach is always uh, best. Uh, you know, it's it's a bit like investing, uh, you know, where you might get that hot stock tip and uh, it might really work for you, but it might turn out to, to not be a very good stock at all. And so I think, you know, that notion of spreading the risk or in this case, trying different things uh, mm. to, uh, to stimulate benefit is a good strategy. And so if that means you might try one specific type of interval training or any type of exercise for a period of a few weeks or months, and then you switch, that's fine. Or are others want to basically do a different workout almost every day, or, you know, during the week, they're always going to vary it up, uh, or others, you know, we'll do it for a couple of weeks and, and then vary it up. And really that's just a, a variation on athletes who engage in very systematic uh, mm. training and they, they periodize macro cycles, months of time and micro cycles, weeks of time with the goal of ultimately peaking for a certain competition. You know, most people don't need to do that at all, but it's just a yeah. variation on that theme quite simply of, of varying it up maybe systematically or even randomly over time to try and stimulate different responses within the body. Right. Yeah, it's, so, so the point, I guess, is, yeah, even if your VO2 max isn't moving, the exercise is doing you good, and you just got to find something different to measure, which does move, rather than stop exercising, which is, yes, I can see that. There's nothing wrong with maintenance as well, because we do mm -hmm. know that, you know, if, if we do nothing, um, right. our VO2 max and other markers of health are just going to continue to decline over time. You know, there's there's inevitable age-related declines. And I know, you know, you and, and many uh, listening or, or watching are interested in this idea of health span, right? And so mm -hmm. keeping health span up as high as possible, I, I, I think exercise is a good <laughs> hedge <laughs> against those declines in health span. So sometimes just, you know, maintaining as long as you can, mm -hmm. or attenuating that inevitable decline is, uh, is, is the goal. So it's not always about improving, it's about defending against the loss. <laughs>